Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Mercia Asset Management PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it received during today's meeting. However, the company will view all questions submitted today and will publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll, and I'm sure the company will be most grateful for your participation. It gives me great pleasure to hand over to Mark Payton, CEO. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and, and thank you, Mark. And I do encourage those questions to come through. We'll be looking at them throughout the presentation and try and theme them at the end and look to address them all. So welcome everybody to our interim results. For those that we have not had the privilege of meeting yet, just a few introductions from those presenting to yourselves. So my name, Mark Payton, Chief Executive and co-founder of Mercia, uh, strong background actually in venture and life sciences and still have a number of portfolio responsibilities as well as running the group in the life science space. Martin. Yes, hi, good afternoon everyone. I'm Martin Glanfield, CFO. I joined Mark just over eight years ago as employee number seven to help Mark float the business on AIM. And my background is as CFO of multiple public companies uh, in the technology space. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, Julian Vigors, Chief Investment Officer. So uh, I joined um, Mercia on its acquisition of Enterprise Ventures back in 2016. Um, and uh, have looked after um, many of uh, Enterprise Ventures and, and now Mercia's uh, venture funds. One of the first of those, uh, going back to 2003 stroke four, um, was a, a fund that included uh, Blue Prism. We were the first uh, investors in Blue Prism, which is a software business. Um, and we ended up uh, for our 900,000 pounds investment uh, at the time we invested, uh, we realised ultimately uh, about £95 million off the back of that. So, um, again, 20 years or so in, in, in venture capital doing uh, exactly the sort of deals that, that we're uh, doing now. Great. Thank you, Martin. Julian. This first slide really summarises what have been for this first half of our year, uh, a continued strong progress. Strong progress in respect of the Mercia 2020 uh, strategic goals, and I'll speak to those in a moment at our midpoint. I think importantly, in this period of uncertainty, very strong liquidity, just under 300 million in free unrestricted cash across our managed funds and our balance sheet. And of course, those managed funds are long dated 10 year plus or evergreen funds that are subject are not subject to redemptions. In respect of the uh, equity portfolio across the managed funds and the balance sheet, uh, well-funded and modest capital needs as well. So that means that uh, in times of uncertainty, if other investors retrench, something we call syndication risk and, and move backwards from the portfolio companies, typically we're able to support and really preserve value in our own right in those businesses. The group itself is highly resilient. Uh, sustainable and profitable and continues to be so as we look forwards. That's also reflected in the uh, increase in net asset value per share now at 46.8 pence. That's up from 45.6 pence from the 31st of March 2022. And in line with our progressive dividend policy, I'm pleased to say that we're proposing a 10% increase for the interim dividend at 0.33 pence per share. And to the right, you can see a schematic that has our offices across the country. We are talking to you today from our office in Henley and Arden. Uh, following the acquisition of Frontier Development Capital, FDC, we now have an office in Birmingham in the city centre, uh, which is really important as we continue to grow through the Midlands as well. In respect of the model that Mercia operates, it's a somewhat unique hybrid model comprising of a profitable fund management operation on the left there in pink. Uh, this has complementary asset classes under management across private equity, debt and venture, recurring and profitable and cash generative fee income from that element. And importantly, a series of scalable platforms where we foresee in the near to medium term organic growth in funds under management. Working in symbiosis with that is our proprietary capital, our cash on hand, 
very strong discipline that we operate there in respect of its deployment, where we invest selectively alongside our managed funds into portfolio companies emerging from those. As we look to scale additional funds under management, we can invest as a limited partner in new funds and, of course, use our capital selectively for corporate activities. Those two <coughs> pools of capital fully aligned as we look to drive both capital growth as refined and NAV per share and yield and prime our progressive dividend policy. And in terms of corporate activities, ahead of today, we've made two acquisitions. Julian just alluded to Enterprise Ventures, our first one in 2016. And when looking at acquisitions, we have a very strict discipline following what we call a value driver analysis. And what that means is we're looking for at least 20 defensible reasons why an acquisition should take place. And those form part of the integration planning exercise as we look to extract value from that acquisition thereafter. At the top of that list is strong cultural fit and not part of that list are cost synergies. We're not looking at stripping costs out of businesses. We're looking at accessing capabilities to scale the broader group following the acquisition. We look to adjacent or complementary or more of the same asset classes through these acquisitions. They must, of course, be earnings enhancing. We are focused exclusively on the UK as a domestic market on a regional basis. So we're looking at funds under management scale to that point and looking at a strong fit with the internal capabilities and systems that Mercy has built over time. And that drives the organic growth that derives from that acquisition. As I mentioned, nine years ago now, 2016, Enterprise Ventures, that was acquired on a structured deal of 11 million in total. And that brought across 200 million in third party funds under management against a 7.9 times PBIT. From that acquisition, we saw 150 million of organic funds under management coming through. Three years later, 2019, so three years ago, almost to date, amazingly, we acquired the three VCT fund management contracts from MVM and the team from those VCT operations came across to Mercia. That was on a structured deal, 25 million. We acquired 270 million in third party funds under management against a 6.3 PBIT multiple. And we've seen 66 million of new funds uh, under management come through on that acquisition. And it's pleasing today to announce the acquisition of Frontier Development Capital, FDC. Again, the entire group acquired this time on a structured deal, 9.5 million, bringing across 415 million in third party funds under management against a 7.3 PBIP multiple. So you can see a consistent basis for acquisitions running across those three acquisitions. And a little bit more detail on this slide in terms of the acquisition. FDC is a, an alternative national fund manager um, exclusively focused on providing loans to both SMEs and property developers across the UK through the regions, established in 2016, as I've said, headquartered in Birmingham and 24 employees, which I'm pleased to say all join us today. The transaction in this instance was cash only and not a total consideration of 9.5 million, 5.5 million being the initial part of that and 4 million as part of a deferred consideration over a two year period driven against revenue forecasts and 100 million net in new institutional third party fundraising. The business itself, FDC typically lends 2 million to 10 million and above can lend up to 20 million. And we see this very much as a platform for future FUM growth. And in itself, it fits very tightly and neatly with what we call the complete connected capital, where we see that interplay of the various pools of capital that we manage. So casting this back on the left side there is venture ahead of the acquisition of the VCT fund management contracts. Mercia used to deploy venture in the range of 0.2 million to 2 million. And we saw an opportunity to scale our capabilities and uh, through a further 5 million. So up to the 5 million end, by acquiring the VCT operation. Now you look at what our debt used to do, our legacy debt team here, which is 0.2 to 1 million. FDC then extends that, as I said previously, to 10 million and up to 20 million. So the fit and the complementarity of that is highly attractive, as well as the opportunity to further scale 
FUM. And when you look across the piece and add up the various FUM that we have now, that's grown to circa 1.4 billion, which is quite impressive when you think we started the journey and Marty, Martin alluded to our IPO, where we had something like 30 million of funds under management at that point ahead of our IPO. Just in terms of the discrete pools of capital that we manage, and I think this is quite an important slide to put a, a fine point on where we see growth coming from. We've got retail, which is EIS and VCT, and each year approximately 1.6 billion in EIS and 1.1 billion in VCT is raised nationally. And put that in context, our VCT operation raised circa 40 and our EIS circa 2025 in the last year. And based on our track record of delivery, we would expect to take a significant portion of those annual fundraisers going forwards. The second pool of capital, British Business Bank, we currently manage approximately 40% of the regional venture and debt funds across the UK. Recently, 1.6 billion commitment was made to the next generation of these regional venture and equity funds coming through and we expect to secure a meaningful part of those going forwards too. Greatly facilitated by FDC. We don't have, for instance, a debt competence in the Midlands. We do now. So we would like to think we're well placed going forwards in that regard. And then finally, the institutional capital, that discrete pool of capital, we see this through our private equity and our legacy debt operation. And this is predominantly through pension funds. And uh, these pension funds are typically allocating capital to Mercia through their impact allocations as a regional investor. And we believe that our strong track record now combined with FTC places us in a strong position for future organic fundraising. And to the point on the Mercia 2020 at this midpoint, just to remind you, we'd set two really broad strategic goals of on average over three years, 20 million pre-tax profits. And again, on average over three years, growth in AUM by 20% per annum. And that drives towards the NAV per share growth, as well as our progressive dividend policy. And on the table on the right, you can see the progress at this midpoint as we drive towards 1.6 billion AUM in total over the three year period. We're at 1.4 billion there and uh, 60 million collectively over that three year period in terms of the pre-tax profits over the three years. And we're at approximately um, 35, 36 million there. So strong progress against both those elements of the strategic goals. And then finally, from me, and I mentioned about um, the impact allocations from the regional pension funds, Mercia is very much seen as a responsible impact investor, which is particularly pertinent and relevant for all three pools of capital we manage, both in terms of retail, British Business <coughs> Bank, and those regional pension funds. And these results and our previous results demonstrate that actually responsible investment works. A regional investor with the hybrid model that we've got delivering delivers returns against the expectations of both investees and investors. We have a dedicated responsible investment team within Mercer. I'm part of that team. A little while ago, we launched our first um, knowledge intensive impact EIS fund and that closed much faster than we were expecting and hit its targets. And we've launched recently our second version of that. With the combination of FDC and the announcement today, we have 144 employees, nine regional offices, and 19 university partnerships. And those regional university partnerships, I think, will become increasingly valuable over time. When you look at the team, 41% of the total employees, 21% of the investment team, and two of our five NEDs are women. And this very much reflects our focus as a responsible investment team, looking at both diversity and inclusion. Martin. Thank you, Mark. Our first half uh, results are shown here in this slide, and they are strong results, notwithstanding the macroeconomic backdrop and the general sentiment currently towards the tech sector overall. Headline revenues were 12.2 million, uh, but that did include 1.3 million of revenues relating to the, the VCT fundraising April 2022. So the underlying like for like growth was, in fact, 8%. We've had another strong progress in our adjusted operating profit, in part from uh, further uh, interest coming from our balance sheet portfolio in the finance income line. 
And together with positive fair value movements in the first half, we've achieved profit before tax of 7.4 million. If you plough through the interim statement, you'll see towards the end uh, an interim audit report from our auditors BDO. Although we don't have to, we do subject our half year fair values and our income statement to scrutiny by our auditors. We believe that that adds credibility to our half year results and also transparency uh, for our shareholders. As Mark's mentioned, we have strong liquidity on the balance sheet at the half year at 56.1 million. And as a result of the positive first half performance overall, our NAV per share has grown to 46.8 pence. This next slide shows the movement, first half movement in our assets under management by asset class. And in the first half, we generated new investor inflows of 54 million, being predominantly the VCT fundraise of 41 million in April, including the dividend reinvestment scheme, and 13 million from two successful EIS fundraises, one of which was our first knowledge intensive impact fund. As is true with the, the general market, um, our asset classes have suffered some uh, performance reductions in terms of fair value movements, predominantly those few investments that we have that are on the public markets in the VCT portfolio. And we've also continued to sell investments and return capital to our investors and also pay dividends to our VCT shareholders and our own PLC shareholders. And overall, therefore, at the end of September, our total assets under management were 979 million. And then, of course, post year end, we've increased our assets under management by 415 million from the acquisition last yesterday evening of FTC. And we've just recently been awarded an additional 12 million from the British Business Bank Midlands Engine Investment Fund. So, still further good progress there, too. On an international financial reporting standards basis, this slide shows our income statement for the first half. And you can see there the significant fair value, positive fair value movements of 5.6 million, which Julian will talk to in much more detail in a moment. Uh, as I mentioned, a strong finance income line. And as we are now uh, sustainably a profitable group, um, we've used up our historic tax losses that are, are now tax paying. Over the eight years since our IPO, we've built an incredibly strong balance sheet, which is debt free. And you can see there the balance sheet portfolio that Julian will talk to is now up to 132 million from a circa 10 million standing start. And you can also see the 56 million of unencumbered cash sitting on the balance sheet at the half year. And finally, from a cash flow perspective in the first half, we had positive operating cash inflow. Um, and the largest number in our cash flow statement was the 6.4 million invested into the balance sheet portfolio. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, thanks, Martin. So, uh, as always, some key stats from across the group to kick off. And I think the message really is, is steady as we go at this point. So the top box here shows our deployment levels in H1, um, and they are very similar to the corresponding period uh, a year ago. And um, what it does show is our deal origination activities um, continue to deliver us around 200 um, opportunities per month, which is very strong. And that's enabled us to deploy 56 million uh, across 80 businesses, uh, of which 35 uh, were new to us. The lower uh, box um, also shows that our performance continues to be solid solid another 25 million pounds returned across the equity side of the business and we have undertaken some uh, specific uh, portfolio consolidation i guess across our funds um kind of weeding out some of the older or un underperforming assets uh, and this perhaps is why uh, we've got a slightly greater volume uh, and, lo and lower multiple uh, on the exits this time around but uh, those realizations have continued and now uh, up to 33, 34 million, uh, with that multiple closer to two. Now we are seeing um, some processes, uh, exit processes slowing, um, or indeed pausing in, in the current environment. Um, so I think we're unlikely to see uh, the record uh, 155 million of, of realizations that we saw um, in the year to March. 
12. So on to our direct uh, portfolio. So we have recently added three companies to our balance sheet. So one was in uh, the first half, uh, two in October, just post the period end. So in the period was uh, Unify, which is uh, a deep tech asset. And this really is uh, working at the human machine interface. So uh, this technology allows any surface or, or any form of surface to become um, smart. So if you think about kind of controls uh, for appliances um, uh, or in vehicles, uh, with, with now no need uh, for moving parts. So, so an exciting one, we think. Uh, Axis Spine um, is a, uh, a 10 million deal uh, where we put a syndicate together uh, to include uh, a new um, sector-specific US investor, um, but also money from our own VCTs and EIS funds. And this is a, a, an FDA-cleared um, spinal implant cage system and again this this is um, already doing uh, surgery uh, surgeries sorry in, in the US uh, and we are we are excited about this one uh, Nova uh, is a deal from the northern powerhouse region uh, and it comes from our northern powerhouse equity fund um, <clears throat> excuse me and it uh, is a business that uses um, it's a process uh, technology that converts biomass, uh, woody materials into bioethanol and uh, uh, carbon residue. And, and again, some, some interesting uses for, for, for this uh, in uh, sustainable aviation fuel. So um, again, we have significant what we call our proprietary deal flow that comes out of our funds. So we will uh, be looking to add uh, further new investments over the course of time. So this is our balance sheet uh, in, in numbers. So if you were to look at the first uh, column on the left-hand side, um, our brought forward carrying value of 120 million, uh, to which we added 6.4 million of uh, new cash. Uh, and then that 5.6 million of fair value movements that Martin talked about leaves us with 132 million uh, carrying value at the end of September. <coughs> so in terms of the fair value movement column, we have two uh, large <coughs> equivalent numbers um, of 12.2 million. And this is the result of um, a business that we had, uh, still have in fact, called Intechnica, which uh, split uh, in April into two businesses. Uh, the old, if you like, original consulting business, but also um, a new uh, business uh, that was spawned a, a few years ago, a, a few years ago, called Netasia, which is a product business in uh, security uh, bot management. In terms of the uh, positive movements, um, we have two uplifts at games businesses, Invincibles and Vertrade, um, and that really is as the uh, as the result of revenues uh, growing across the period. We also um, saw significant progress at Warwick. Um, as uh, OE engage, OEM engagement continues, but we also put together a, um, another uh, third party funding round uh, back in the summer. Now those are balanced by um, lower growth software businesses, W2 and Tom UK, uh, which is also called intelligent positioning, where we've applied uh, lower um, sales or ARR multiples um, to, those, to those businesses. We also got a, a, a downward movement on Edge Case Games, which really is a holding company now um, for a future royalty stream uh, from a game which is being developed by Wargaming, which uh, we believe um, is likely to be um, uh, later in terms of its uh, uh, release timings. So overall, I think uh, our portfolio, though, is in, is in good shape. Yeah, so, so this last slide from me um, shows uh, our record to date of realising um, on average 50% above carrying value for our direct assets um, on exit. So what does this say? It, it, it says either our valuations are conservative um, or, or more so probably that uh, many of our assets are actually quite hard to value. Um, but it certainly does um, 
say that I think these um, some of our assets are, are very attractive um, as strategic buying opportunities to, to corporates who are um, willing to pay over perhaps um, the normal kind of valuations you get by applying um, valuation metrics. So, you know, we've seen this very recently with the hundred million pounds exits from both at Fradian and Oxygen. Thank you. So just bringing um, this presentation to a close, actually, as I hope you agree with us that the acquisition has been highly complementary. A lot of advantages now, but also for scaling funds going forwards. It's an earnings enhancing acquisition and also provides a broader debt footprint. And back to the point on scalable distribution, we think with opportunities such as the British Business Bank regional funds, it places us well in terms of securing future opportunities there. The acquisition itself moves us closer to the 2020 strategic vision at this midpoint. And it's another long dated managed fund operation that we've added to the managed fund stable. And that's really important as we plan capital deployment over the long term, both in terms of preserving value as well as growing value within the portfolio. The funds portfolio and importantly, the direct investment portfolio are well funded, diversified portfolio companies, which actually have quite modest capital needs. And I know we've said this over the years, but now more than ever, as capital retrenches, it's really important to be able to preserve value within those investments. The 2% fee margin re remains intact in terms of our scaling fund management funds after this acquisition and importantly, strong liquidity across the group. Now, assume no EIS, no VCT, no top ups to the existing BBB funds, no not securing the next generation of regional funds or indeed additional institutional funds, we still have well in excess of two years cash to invest across our portfolio and our balance sheet. However, we do expect most, if not all of those different pools of capital I just talked about to deliver further organic fundraising in the near term. So thank you very much for all of your attention. We've got uh, a whole load of questions which I've just been grouping and we'll just, answer in the fullness of time. That's, that's, that's great, Mark. Thank you very much indeed. And just to give you guys just a couple of moments to look at those questions, I'd like to remind investors on the call uh, that a copy of the slides along with the published Q&A and the recording will be available via the InvestMeet company dashboard and we'll notify you when that's ready for your review. Uh, Mark, I've given you absolutely no time, so I'm not quite sure why I jumped <laughs> in, but, but either way, hopefully <laughs> You've got one question uh, to, to, to ping out, but you've received a number of questions. So firstly, thank you to everybody on the call for today's uh, for your engagement today. And maybe if I may, Mark, just ask you to read out those questions where it's appropriate to do so. And then I'll pick up from you at the end. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've grouped a number as that was going on and I'll take you through those groupings. And then there's a few at the end. And please do add additional ones because we do have the time to take your questions. So the first lot I've grouped together are to do with the direct investments. <clears throat> the first question, which actually I'll take because it's a quick answer, which is will the because we can write checks of up to sort of 20 million with the frontier development with FDC acquisition. Does that mean our direct investments will be larger as well? And the short answer to that is no. And that's because actually, if you look at our balance sheet portfolio, they comprise almost exclusively of businesses that we've co-invested with our venture funds. So it would be unusual if never really in terms of debt funds being co-investments. So that does not influence the direct investment strategy, doesn't change that at all. The next question in regard to the direct investments, Julian, if I can pass to you. Well, there's two questions here. The first one is Axis, which um, uh, uh, is mentioned as a, you know, a nice looking business. What, what is the size of our equity holding in that? And are there other co-investors? And in which case, who are the other co-investors with us on that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to get slightly caught out here, Mark, I'm afraid. But um, so in terms of access, our, our percentage holding from, from memory is, is somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Um, but our funds uh, also hold uh, another sizable chunk, you know, perhaps 30 percent. I can get the. Um, I can publish the exact details at some point, but um, yes, it is. I think, as I said, we 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 do have a, a U.S. strategic investor in in that syndicate now, and uh, it is a, sub, a substantial opportunity, many hundreds of millions of dollars, um, and 
the company does also have the ability to do um, slightly adjacent um, surgeries as well. Um, so yes, we are very excited about it. It's a big opportunity. And another question uh, was that they were under the belief that Warwick Acoustics WA had gone into insolvency, which it clearly hasn't. But I wondered if you wanted to just broaden out, reassure them about Warwick Acoustics and perhaps shed some light on which one, I'm not aware which one that is, but which one that could be alluded to. Yeah, the, so Warwick Acoustics is, is certainly not um, in, in insolvency. Um, it, it's, it's doing really well, actually. It's, it's a, it's again, it's a deep tech asset um, looking at um, its kind of flat speaker technology, which are, which are um, very high quality, very lightweight, flexible, um, that they can, they can go in um, uh, vehicle uh, headrests or above, um, above drivers and, and create sound pods. It's, so it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting opportunity for us, um, particularly in the kind of cabins of the future and, and light weighting. Um, arguments uh, and you know we, we are <clears throat> currently undergoing uh, four four different uh, kind of partnerships with with different uh, OEMs at the minute so uh, some some exciting times for Warwick actually. Thank you thank you. So the next questions relate to the interplay Julian between the funds and the balance sheet so one question uh, is, you know, how do the returns broadly of the funds compare to the returns broadly of the balance sheet? Is there a comparison, a comparator there? Yeah, so, so given that the funds um, go in uh, earlier than, than the balance sheet, you know, on successful exits, um, in, in particular, um, for example, we, we, we we, if, if you look at oxygen, and again, I'm not going to quote uh, the exact numbers, but you know the funds um, would have made uh, substantial multiples of, of, of returns, so ten to fourteen times, I believe, um, and the balance sheet would have would have also made significant returns, but but lower because they they the uh, the balance sheet would have gone in later, and that, and that is very much the model. So you know when both the funds uh, and it's right that the funds take uh, higher returns because they typically take take higher risks. So um, you know it is our um, model and, and key intent that both the funds and the balance sheet makes those uh, very solid returns uh, when we invest in, a, in 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 any asset. Thank you, Julian. And an, another question, sort of relating to that, asks. Um, so I think very, very kindly says about the. Uh, net asset value of our direct investments has been preserved and is in good shape. Um, however, if you compare that to what's happened with the northern VCTs, they seem to have had a degree of NAV erosion. Is that because we have a different valuation policy between the northern VCTs and the balance sheet? Or is this just a, uh, a result really of the balance sheet selectively investing in fund assets rather than in all assets? I mean, I think I think that I mean it, it's almost neither of those because we, we certainly don't have any different valuation policies. The um, the fundamental reason for for the declines in the VCTs is is really down to um, particular exposures. We've got a, a, a small number of um, exposures to listed assets within our VCT operation, and and it's and it's that that has caused. Uh, the, the relative, or if you like, relatively larger um, falls in the VCTs versus our our balance sheet. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, actually, you make a very good point there. We have just one listed investment, only a small one, in Correct, my health check yeah. yeah. on the balance sheet. Um, and then the final question to you, Julian, and then Martin, I'm coming over to you, uh, is to do with the investees themselves that we support. So, do we play an active role with the investees? And if we are playing an active role, do we think that that track record helps us secure additional opportunities going forwards? Yeah, I think I think I think that's right. So so um, yes, we do play an active role, and and, and we, we 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 typically take take board seats on on every asset, certainly all the balance sheet assets, um, and that clearly involves a, a monthly meeting 
with with the business. Um, that's that's clearly not it, not it either. You know, we're we're typically on the on the phone or, or the the Zoom at least um, every week with, with our with our businesses. Um, but I guess in many ways, more importantly, um, we have the ability to to help those businesses when they are um, looking at recruiting, be it key um, uh, non-exec directors or or, or chair um, or um, adding to the, the financial capability of those businesses. So we have <clears throat> what we call a talent network, which uh, Lisa Ward heads heads up for us. So we have uh, over a thousand um, non-executive uh, and executive directors within our database. Um, so we can we can uh, choose and, and, and introduce those um, you know experienced entrepreneurs um, and operators. To, to our businesses and, and in fact also um, what we are doing a lot more of uh, recently is is adding again perhaps for for more shorter term assignments some operating partners in where you know if, if we need a tweak to the business model or we'd like them to look at the um, you know the route to market or, or the marketing um, collateral or processes or whatever it might be um, then we can find individuals that we can add in to help in that way. So on top of that, um, we also have portfolio seminars where we, we introduce CEOs and, and chairs together. Um, we provide information across the portfolio. We do newsletters um, and we have a, a whole group of um, kind of shared services that, that um, our portfolios can, can access, uh, which, which typically save, saves them money as well. So yeah, I would, I would say that we do provide um, quite significant uh, other levels of, of support to our businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And um, actually, it's not a, a question, but a, a comment that somebody made in respect of what you were saying about listed securities, etc. with the VCTs, is that Entertainment Magpie clearly has had a, a negative impact as well in that regard. Uh, yeah, and, and that and that is, you know, if, if, if you consider that the, the, the the business was was listed at um, I think it was one one pound eight eighty or one pound ninety. You know its share price um, has suffered uh, very significantly um, and is now at uh, twenty twenty five or so p. Um, you, you can you can tell that that's had a significant effect on on the VCTs nav. So absolutely. yes, absolutely. Thank you. So. Um, Martin, um, a number of questions relating yeah. to the finance and uh, to FDC in particular. Yeah. So um, is there a sort of property exposure in respect of the FDC portfolio? And in terms of the debt, if there is, is there a sort of debt stack in which they sit in? Yeah, thank you, Mark. <coughs> I think the first fundamental point to make, if I may, is that FDC is not lending from its own balance sheet. It has therefore no risk of any losses on any loans. These, it is a fund manager of third party funds. So in, that's quite a fundamental uh, mm. point. Um, in terms of the 415 million of funds under management, uh, approximately 210 million of that are, are property facilities. And there is no, there's no dominant borrower um, in, in, the, in the portfolio. There are approximately across the whole 415 million of funds under management, approximately 100 borrowers, of which probably 25 are, are property companies. But as I just mentioned, uh, uh, there is no sort of dominant borrower. And typically, even if there is a, say, a 10 million pound uh, facility that's been made available, at any one moment in time, the amount drawn down is more likely to be between two and five million rather than the full um, 10 million. So, FDC and therefore Mercia is not exposed to any any risks um, in terms of the the businesses to whom it has lent in the property sector, and that is why, to answer perhaps the second question, I can see why the deferred consideration is linked to revenue and not to profitability. And the reason for that is if you link deferred consideration to property to to profits, it's much harder to make any changes that you wish to make to the business during the earnout period, because understandably the vendors, uh, if their uh, earnout is linked to profits, don't want the acquirer to really to be meddling in their business. However, 
in this case, by linking the deferred consideration to revenue, FDC's vendors, who are the management of the business and are all staying with the business, are very keen for Mercia to help support the revenue targets uh, by obviously bringing to bear all of our own networks and introducers that we can bring to help them achieve those targets. Because, you know, for them to achieve their revenue targets over the next two years, that will obviously help Mercia achieve its own targets. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And then um, another question relates actually to the sort of fee as a percentage of the funds. And there's an observation that it may be lower in the FDC funds than it is across the group and whether we see an opportunity to adjust that fee level. Um, I, I don't personally see an opportunity to adjust the fee level. I, I think we're very uh, appreciative of the support that the particularly the West Midlands funds uh, give to to FDC um, and yes they are the fund management fees um, as a percentage of the funds under management are lower than one might typically uh, receive from say a British business bank fund however with the British business bank funds one one is allowed to charge a, a base fund management fee but no fees in relation to the deployment of the capital in that fund whereas with FDC um, it is allowed, generally speaking, it is allowed to charge arrangement fees when it makes a loan and also on occasions to charge a monitoring fee during the period that the loan is outstanding. Uh, an additional question that's just come in um, is relating to the level of bad debt uh, provisions on FDC. And do we see these developing considering the UK and the headwind and the predicted recession, et cetera? Yes, and, and at the moment, uh, say so this is not FDC is not lending from its own balance sheet at the moment. Its funds and the loans that it's made from the funds under management are performing very well indeed. Uh, they aren't just simple, straightforward loans. They often attract um, an equity warrant in certain circumstances, and they are secured. So um, these are not uh, high-risk uh, loans made to startup companies. The the businesses with which FDC chooses to trade. Uh, and and lend from its funds under management are are well established, typically Midlands based um, property companies. Thank you. And um, what we haven't we have spoken about the organic fundraising options and opportunities for the FDC based operation. But perhaps you could tell us the number of funds they're managing, yeah. the nature of the investors in those funds, and therefore give confidence to those listening today that these are strong, credible institutional investors. Uh, absolutely. Um, so there are approximately nine funds uh, under management at various stages of deployment uh, with, with various end dates. Uh, some of the funds are recyclable um, and some of the funds run into the 2030s. So in general, these are long dated uh, funds. In terms of who are the limited partners or who are the providers of the funds, it's a combination of uh, Birmingham City Council Pension Fund, West Midlands Combined Authority and other regional pension funds um, that, that uh, FDC um, is working on behalf of. In terms of future fundraising, um, they are beginning to now to start to talk to potential third party uh, limited partners in new funds and they, uh, they hope to broaden their reach outside of the West Midlands, further afield to other uh, regional um, pension funds. Fabulous, thank you very much. The next one relates to the progressive dividend policy. And there's a question here about um, uh, why are we confident that we can continue with the progressive dividend policy? Um, and is it uh, necessary for balance sheet realizations to carry on with that progressive dividend policy? Uh, yes, and when we uh, first um, announced our progressive dividend policy, we were very clear that we were not linking future dividends to a cover ratio in relation to adjusted operating profit um, or to, to any other aspect of our income statement because of the two sides of our model, which is our cash generative fund management operations and, of course, periodic realizations from our balance sheet portfolio. So, again, we're not anchored to one or the other. Uh, and we believe that the maturity, continuing maturity of the balance sheet portfolio will over time provide realisation proceeds to help support the dividend, but also the cash generative nature of our growing funds under management will also continue to support our progressive dividend policy. Excellent. And the last question, if we please say that, Martin, is considering the gap that we have on a NAV per share to share price basis, 
is a share buyback a strategy we should be pursuing? Yes, and that's again a question that we quite understandably received with our March preliminary results. And it's something that we never rule out ever, ever. However, um, sophisticated investors such as uh, Terry Smith, for example, have previously said on a number of occasions that um, the idea of share buybacks is only a good idea if a company has no better use for those funds. Uh, and we certainly believe that we do, and we believe that this acquisition is the demonstration of that. However, if one was to actually run the maths on, say, a 10 million pound share buyback at, say, 30 pence, this would enable 33.3 million Mercia shares to be bought back, which would represent, uh, based on our March cash position of 60 million, that would represent 16% of our cash gone from our balance sheet against a somewhat un uncertain economic backdrop, whilst the only benefit in NAV per share to shareholders would only be 1.3 pence from a 10 million pound share buyback. And if you were looking at it from an increase in dividend per share, that would be 0.6 of a penny. So actually for us, because of the belief that we do have better things to do with our cash, we don't believe that a share buyback would be in the best interest of shareholders. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That's great. Uh, Mark, Martin, Julian, you've taken every question from investors uh, this afternoon. So thank you once again to everybody for their engagement. Um, Mark, I uh, know investor feedback is important to you and to the company, and I'll shortly redirect those on the call to give you their feedback. But I wondered if I may, before doing so, just ask you for a few closing comments, and then I'll redirect the investors. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And once again, thank you for allowing us to use this portal, which we think is a magnificent way of reaching to our many and valued retail investors, whom are also very often within our EIS funds and our VCT funds. So I'd like to thank you all for your support and actually end on a note of optimism, because I think there's a very limited amount of that in the current climate, which is that we have developed a strong business operating across the regions and very much open for business. We're looking for private equity, for venture and for debt deals, and are pleased to say that we are in an unprecedented times of busyness, which is great, but we will always be open for business going forward. So thank you, everybody. And we look forward to sharing our prelims with you in the fullness of time. That's great, Mark. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Julian and Martin, for your time this afternoon. Can I please ask investors on the call not to close this session as we now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. This may take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Mercia Asset Management PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. I wish you all a very good afternoon. Thank you.